All right, guys. So I am here with uh, Mark Bell, aka Smelly Bell, and we are at Super Training Gym. We got some training this morning. We're talking to uh, Seth Rollins or Colby, and uh, just got some coffee. And now I wanted to dive into um, a little bit of Mark Bell. Is that okay? That sounds good to me. So we we're just talking. Um, for those of you who don't know who Mark Bell is, I think a lot of people um, know him as a powerlifter. He's set um, world records. He's done a lot of stuff in the powerlifting world. But what a lot of people might not know about him is that he pivoted from, you know, just powerlifting to building a really successful business. And he's built that with a great team and also his wife. And I think that's really intriguing to me. And so what I want to talk about today is kind of like, um, kind of take us back to how I got into powerlifting and what that looked like. And then, and then let's kind of shift towards, you know, 10, 15 years ago when we created the slingshot and how that's changed and what is like working with your wife. And I kind of want to touch base on a little bit of business, a little bit of family, a little bit of fitness. So I guess the first question is, how did you first get introduced to powerlifting? Because I know your kind of whole family is kind of mm -hmm. in it. Yeah, you know, it's uh, like it's become a Bell family tradition. And just recently had my son uh, hit up a workout with me, and that that was really cool. And uh, hopefully it's something that he uh, ends up enjoying. We'll, we'll kind of see how it works out. Um, for myself, um, you know, my older brothers, they were into lifting. Um, but ultimately what happened was, and I think this is important, I think, you know, self-discovery is kind of where the magic is at and self-education is where the magic is at. So it's kind of cool if someone pulls you into something and they say, hey, you should try this. But it's even better when you discover how great that is for you personally. So my brothers showed me some lifting stuff, but I wasn't really uh, I wasn't really all about it. I wasn't really, how old was this? I was probably like 11, You're 11. 12, something like that, you know. Um, and so I was uh, playing football one day. I was just chucking around the football and like, I was kind of a loner for some reason. I had friends and stuff, but like I was always doing stuff by myself too. I'm just chucking this football up up in the air. And I, I normally I was by myself because I was usually hanging out with my brothers. And my brother, Chris, is uh, four years older than me. My brother, Mike, was six years older. So the older kids didn't want to, you know, throw, throw around a football with a little kid. <clears throat> and so I'm chucking around this football one day. And the guy's like, hey, Bell, throw me the football. And I should have known about it better because this guy was a dick. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and so I, I half-heartedly, you know, chuck him the ball or whatever. He turns around and just kicks it as far as he can. He just punts it into the woods. And then I could never find the ball again. And I remember just feeling like, it just made me feel like crap because I was like, I mean, not that I would have beat him up. or I'm not a violent person, but like I could have at least, you know, stood up for myself and, and said like, dude, what are you doing? Like, that's right. crap. What are you, why'd you do that? But, you know, I didn't say anything. This guy was pretty big. And at the time, I thought he was jacked. You know, looking back on it, he wasn't that jacked. But he had some biceps on him. And he was, uh, I, I remember seeing was he him. So he was older than you? He was an older guy. And I remember, like, you know, people used to sweat him because he used to, like, curl a lot of weight, which is so funny now looking back on it. But this is a long time ago. This guy had a mullet. He had the acid wash jeans on. He had the, the Reebok high tops going. Well, but, but you remember him. I mean, oh, yeah, this, absolutely. So, so this was a, a point in your life that was kind of a turning point. Yeah, absolutely. And so what you said at that point, you wanted to start lifting more. Yeah. Were just, you scrawny at 11? Were you no, small? No, like, you're a pretty I, big I was, guy right now. Yeah, I was I was a pretty big kid, and uh, but I wasn't, like, confident, you know? And so I, I kind of thought to myself, well, my brothers are showing me that lifting stuff, and, like, you know, maybe if I was stronger, maybe I could, like, defend myself. There was no MMA at the time and stuff like that, so I thought this would be a good way to, to be able to, like, defend myself or stand up for myself. And so uh, that was kind of the start of it. And you can kind of cut to, to a Rocky montage of me going in the garage. And I thought like, you know, that whole summer, I, I remember like training and I had him in mind and I was like using that as fuel. And really? I've done that my whole life. I've always used like almost like negative energy. I've turned it into like calories and, and I've used it as as energy for my body and used it to fuel me. And so that whole summer I was training and training and training and, and nothing ever really came of it. I, you know, I, I, you know, ran into him, you know, years later and stuff, but I never like, you know, never, you know, avenged my, uh, him punt my football into the woods or whatever, you know? So you never found the football? <clears throat> I never found the football. It's my favorite football. is my New York Jets football. Oh, and so at this point, your brothers were lifting, you get into powerlifting, and then did you play uh, sports throughout high school? <clears throat> yeah, I, I played, uh, I played football. I did track and I got into boxing as well. I did a bunch of different stuff. Um. I, I loved sports. I, I played a lot of basketball and, uh, yeah, it was, I, I loved playing sports. And like when I was on the track team, <clears throat> the coach was like, Hey, you know, if you think you're going to come on this team and just be like a thrower or something, 
uh, I got news for everybody. Like everyone on this team is going to run. And I was like, oh my God. I was like, this is going to be hard. Cause I was kind of, I was getting fat at the time. I was getting big and fat. You know, the powerlifting stuff was, I, I was lifting, but I didn't know about nutrition. So I was getting big and fat. And once we started running, actually it was great for me because the weight started coming off. I started getting better shape and it, it was a, uh, it was a good thing. But yeah, I love, I, I still love, wa- I love watching sports. I love participating in sports. No shifting. Well, how did the powerlifting career start to develop? So when did you start competing in, in, in powerlifting? I started competing in powerlifting right away. Powerlifting was, uh, you know, so I started messing around with weights at like 11 and by 12, 13, I was already competing. You know, it was pretty quick. What happened was, is I was, uh, bench pressing with some of my friends one day and, um, they were struggling to like move the bar and <clears throat> one of them did like a 10 on each side. But I remember that day, you know, doing like a plate on each side and they were like, what the, you know, they were kind of like confused. They're like, holy crap. And then maybe a few months later, my cousin was, was at my house and my brother told my cousin, he's like, smelly can bench 205. My cousin's like, no way. Cause my cousin was the same age as my brother, Chris. And he's like, there's no way he like says, I can't even bench that. And he's like, well, he did it, you know? And so he's like, well, prove it to me. So we go down in the basement and we load up some weights. And not only did I bench 205, but I benched uh, 205 and 210 and 215. My brother was really cautious with me. He kept putting on just five extra pounds until I ended up uh, finishing at like 240 pounds. And my cousin was like, oh my God. And my cousin actually said, and I remember it like it was yesterday, when I got up off the bench, he said, that's going to turn into something. I don't know what, but that's going to like be something. Well, it sure has. And so <laughs> yeah. from that point on, you started competing. And so were you, you were competing in powerlifting then throughout high school, and then you kept competing, right? So then how did that make you feel? So we were talking earlier, and one of the things we were discussing was that in high school, there's like little groups that kind of congregate, right? Some so clicks, you had the, yeah. clicks, right? You had the football team, this team. And even though you were playing sports, you know, you were alluding to that you still felt like you were different from everybody else. And so looking back on high school, was that the way it was where you kind of felt like you were off on your own kind of tangent and everybody else was kind of doing their own thing? Yeah. So what happened with me is because I had a learning dis- disability, I was put in special classes with other kids. And so, you know, I, I, this is, you know, this is like the names that we were called. This is not something I believe, but we were called retards, you know, and we were, I was put in these classes and I was with the, all these different kids. So those kids didn't have, uh, they, they weren't in these cliques. They weren't with the popular kids. They weren't, you know, going out on Friday night and drinking and they weren't going to prom and they weren't, cause they weren't like invited to any of this stuff. You know, they weren't. And th- these are classes that you were participating in through because of a learning disability. Yeah. And th- those were right. all of your classes or just some of your classes? Uh, most, you know, yeah. Usually I got placed in those classes, um, for one reason or another. And uh, I just saw the divide, you know, because I was on that side of things. So I saw the divide in the school and I was like, um, I, I was I was like, uh, you know what? I'm not really, I don't really want to, like those kids, they bully the same kids that I'm in class with. And I've seen that happen before and I'd break up fights and I'd get, I'd, I'd get into fights and then, you know, I'd get into to the principal's office and they'd say, you know, why'd you throw that kid in the ground or what? I didn't like punch people or whatever, but like I was just at like 12, 13 years old. And, uh, you know, the, the principal would say, Hey, why'd you do that? And I said, well, this, this kid just came up and knocked the kid's books out of his hands for no, you know, I, I didn't see any reason for it. He just knocked them out of his hands and he shoved them up against the locker. And so I, I threw his ass on the ground, you know? Right. And, and so there was a lot of that stuff going on. And that's, and that's part of the reason why I didn't participate in a lot of that stuff. And then as I got a little older, once I started becoming a little bit more mature, I was like, that stuff's kind of stupid. Like, I don't want to drink. I don't want to smoke weed. Like that's, that's for, like, I, I knew at a very young age, I was like, that's for losers. That's for people that want to be stuck. And I don't want to be stuck. I want to try to like make something of myself. I want to do something. And uh, lifting was something that gave me a lot of confidence. I always felt really good with that. And so I was like, there's going to be a time and a place where at some point I do something physical. I do something with my body that is going to be cool. And it's going to be something that I could, you know, I don't know, maybe do something even bigger with. Well, it seems like lifting kind of gave you an outlet and a, and a way to kind of be bigger towards these other kids. So I think- right you looked at lifting like, okay, if I lift more, 
I'm going to be in better shape. I'm going to get bigger so that these kids aren't going to be able to bully me. Sounds like that was a, mm-hmm. a component, obviously. Yeah. And then as you started getting better, you started getting good at it at really, really lo- relatively young age. There were so some I, other things going on too. Like, because, so I was in those, you know, classes and stuff like that. But what also gave me other perspective is I was fat. You know, I wasn't like the fat kid. I wasn't the fattest kid in the school. I didn't have like an obesity problem, but I was fat and I, I wasn't liked by girls, or at least I didn't think I was. And so that that played huge into a lot of it, too, because a lot of these kids would go to these parties because there's chicks there. But I was like, well, I don't think any of these chicks are digging me. So what's the point in even going? And so for me, I was like, I, I'm going to not worry about that stuff. I'm going to train. I'm going to concentrate. I want to, you know, I want to be a football player. That was my dream as a kid. I want to be a football player. And so I'm going to train and I'm going to, you know, do stuff for football. But as I got a little bit older and as I started getting more mature and as I started lifting more, I started dropping weight. I started getting in really good shape. And now these same girls that were like making fun of me are, are now kind of in the picture. And I'm like, I'm not having any of that. Like, I'm not cool with that. Like, I don't want you to like me just because I got jacked. You know right, I mean? right, right. And so how did you overcome that? So you're, you're a high school kid early on. I was bigger in high school too, but so you're, you, you're kind of anti drinking, et cetera. I right. get it. Which kind of already puts you in a unique category because everybody else isn't. You are, you have, you know, some special needs in terms of your education, which already, again, puts you in another category, right, right wrong or indifferent, it just puts you in a little bit of a different category. And then you have this weight on top of that. So all these different things make you kind of stand out for lack of a better term. Yeah. Had you, so did you overcome that just by, you really put all your emphasis into sports? Is that kind of the, where your headspace was? Because I imagine that was tough to, you know, did, was there times where you had to, I mean, you got the bullying, you have this, that, was it lonely? And how'd you overcome that? Yeah, it's hard to, it's hard to uh, make sense of it all because I was still extremely popular. I had two older brothers that went, through the same school as I did. And so uh, everybody kind of knew about me and I excelled in sports. And so therefore I was popular with that and I was the strongest kid in the school. And so there was a lot of, uh, a lot of people knew about me. Um, My mom would like call the school and like tell them like the weights I lifted and stuff. And then they would announce it over the loudspeaker. You know, they announce like, you know, this kid scored X amount of touchdowns over the loud. And I was so embarrassed because like powerlifting wasn't a thing. Right. I'd like cr- I'd cringe. I'd, I'd creep down in my chair and I'd be like embarrassed because nobody knew what powerlifting was. They'd be like, oh, Mark Bell went to this contest and he, you know, benched whatever, 275 or whatever, whatever the weight was at the time. And uh, and I, I always thought it was kind of weird, but I was popular. So I, I wasn't like, um, I like isolated myself. You know, I isolated myself because I didn't like the behavior that I saw from a lot of other people. And, and I was friends with a lot of those kids that were in those uh, special classes with me and stuff like that. And so you talk about your mom calling in and, you know, announcing your accomplishments. Yeah. Uh, my parents are extremely supportive over everything I've done with CrossFit and even before that playing football. And so now your parents live next door to you, right? Yeah. And which is awesome. And you've been able to build this very successful business that's allowed you to live next door to your parents, which I think is great. But growing up, were your parents extremely supportive of the powerlifting thing? Or did they want you, when you left high school, did you go on to college? Uh, so my, my parents have been extremely supportive of every single thing I've ever done. It's, it's uh, you know, I've always said, like, if I could be, you know, half the man that my dad is, like, my life will be complete. My, my dad's just, and a lot of, I'm sure a lot of people out there feel the same way about their mom or their dad, but. Uh, both my parents. I mean, it's, uh, you know, I, I, I'm, I hope that I can be mentioned in the same breath uh, in terms of being a parent as, uh, as them. They were there for everything all the time. And so they, they were, uh, they were great. Uh, and then in terms of going to college, yeah, like just, I felt the same pressure that a lot of people felt where you have to go to college. I think we're at an interesting time now, parents, if you're listening, you cannot hold college over your child's head anymore because it's not a path to anything necessarily. It could be, could be a path to a great career, could be a, a path to a, a great life, but you, they're seeing more and more people all the time that are just becoming popular through Instagram. I mean, there's people making millions of dollars playing video games. There's lots of crazy things going on right now. Lots of crazy things. I mean, so, so did you end up, so did you go the path through college? Yeah, I, I went to a junior college in while well, I lived in New York. I grew up in Poughkeepsie, New York, and went to uh, Hudson Valley Community College, which is in Albany. And I went there for about a year, and then I uh, I visited my brother who lived in uh, Los Angeles, and he was going to USC Film School. 
And when I came out, my brother was filming a movie and I was on a movie set and I was like, oh my God, like, where am I? Like where I was from, like nothing like that happened. It was crazy. My brother had like legitimate actors on set. This was a 20 minute short film that he, that he did. But I mean, it, it was the real deal. They were on a sound stage and they had, um, these big cameras and I, I was overwhelmed. I was like, what? I was like, what is this? And I was like working on the movie and stuff. Right. And so you were like 19 at this time, 20? Yeah. 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 I'm probably about 19. And I was like, wow. I'm like, this is awesome. And I asked my brother, I'm like, hey man, I was like, was the weather like this all the time? He's like, every day. I'm like, are you serious? And I'm like, so the last, I said the last 20 days I was in New York, I was counting down the days to go see him because me and my brother are really close. I said, it rained every day. <laughs> He goes, I've been here for two years. It hasn't rained once. <laughs> yeah. I was like, I was like, oh my God. And so from that point, I was like, I, I don't know how I'm going to figure it out, but I'm, I'm going to move to California and that's where I want to be. It seems like, it seems like it would just make me happier. Not that I was ever depressed, but man, the snow and the rain and the cold and stuff of New York can, uh, can keep you pretty somber. So the weather pulled you to California at the time you're still powerlifting. Uh, so powerlifting kind of came and went a bunch of times, but the pull back towards it, you know, was really, really strong every single time. And that's when you'll know when something is really, uh, like almost like destiny, I guess you'd say when something's really going to happen for you, that's when you're going to know is it's undeniable. You can't even shove it away. Like it, I, I kind of have said that powerlifting chose me. I didn't really choose it because it, it just kept coming back stronger and stronger. Every time I tried to get away from it, I was like, no, I'm going to be a football player. No, I'm going to be a pro wrestler. No, I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. Nothing ever worked except for lift, except for powerlifting. So then did you end up going to school again in California or did you leave that behind? Yeah, so I went to Santa Monica City College where I played football and um, and went to school there and I I played with uh, Chad Ochocinco. He was oh, yeah. uh, he was yeah, our yeah. wide receiver. Okay, and also Steve Smith, who's a hall Hall of Fame wide receiver as well. So hopefully, I get those guys on the podcast uh, one of these days. Those guys never went to practice, so they barely know me. But uh, <laughs> it, yeah, it was it was a great opportunity. Um, I was in over my head, uh, and it, it it was it was healthy for me though. And this also happened to me in professional wrestling. When I got into professional wrestling, and when I even just at this junior college, I quickly realized like. I'm not the, I'm not the man, you know, I'm not, I'm not as good yeah. as I thought I was. Like, I'm, I'm okay. I'm pretty good. I can make some tackles. I can make some plays. I can do some stuff. I can run pretty fast. I'm pretty strong, but I'm not like these guys. These guys are on another level. And when I went into pro wrestling, uh, which was years later, but when I went into pro wrestling, I quickly identified like, I'm not like that guy. I'm not like that guy. I'm not like that guy. I mean, you could, it was one person after another. I was in Louisville, Kentucky at the WWE uh, training headquarters, you could, I mean, each person had a absolutely perfect body and each person could get in the ring and perform all these crazy moves and each person can get up there in front of a group of 30, 40 people, uh, which was just our, our peers, it was just other wrestlers, and deliver a really powerful message in terms of like do, cutting like a promo whether it be 30 seconds or they'll say, Jason Kalipa, get up there. You're fighting Andrew Zaragoza. Uh, July 31st uh, in West Sacramento, go. You're going to go for three minutes, and you'll go for three minutes, and then they'll say, they'll change it on you, boom, like that. Okay, you're fighting John Cena, and you're fighting him in Alabama, and you got 30 seconds, and you got to boom, 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 boom. These guys are just, and girls, they were phenomenal. And I quickly realized, well, I'm not, yeah. I'm pretty good at this, but I don't have the craft down the way these guys do. Well, so, so talking about that, you know, I think with powerlifting, you've obviously been dedicated to that at a very young age, but when you, when you're playing football and you kind of recognize that you weren't at the same caliber as some of these other players, or even with, um, with professional wrestling, do you think it's because they had this long background, this long quote destiny, like powerlifting found you, you didn't find power. Do you think wrestling found them? Do you think you were just in the wrong, you were pursuing the wrong venture? And how did you know that? I didn't love it. Well, it was the truth of it. I didn't truly love it. Like I, I did love football, but I think I didn't know at a young enough age. Like if I would have, and as, uh, I, I don't really know if if this would have happened, but I think that my outcome in football would have been different if I knew more about nutrition, if I knew more about sleep, if I knew more about training. Now I did train really hard for it, but I don't think I trained like looking back at it. I didn't train like specifically for it. So. I might have been able to change the outcome there, but who knows? Maybe genetically, I just wasn't 
uh, fit for it or whatever you want to say. But one thing I recognized that I thought was really healthy for me was <clears throat> that I, for whatever reason, I cannot put the things together that some of these other men and women can put together, whether it be in football or whether it was in uh, pro wrestling. And that was healthy for me in a sense that it, it made me shift gears. It made me change my goals. It made me change my dreams. And I don't think that's a negative thing. I think that's a good thing. I think that people do need to get punched in the mouth. People do need to go into the real world and say, whoa, that guy, okay. Whew, okay, man, uh, let, me, let me take a deep breath here. That, that person is uh, a lot faster than me. Yeah. That person's a lot stronger than me. They're... That person's a lot better at CrossFit than me. Like it's, it's, that's a healthy thing. I'm sure you recognized it. Yeah. You, you won the CrossFit Games. And then you keep trying, keep trying, keep trying, and you're like, "Yeah, I could, I could double my efforts, but like, yeah, it's probably it, time for me to move on." Well, and, and recognizing, you know, for me, um, you know, it's just recognizing that there's a lot of work that comes in all these things. So you might look at it and take a guy like Rich Froning. You might say, "Hey, you know, never heard of him." Yeah, uh, he's a four-time CrossFit Games champion. You might say, "Hey, he's naturally gifted." Sure, he has these natural talents he's been given, but he puts in so much work for so many years. And I think it's really important that when you put yourself in this professional wrestling, as an example, I mean, how many times have these guys been up on stage and had to do this? How many times have they had to go out there and work out to get that perfect body? And I think sometimes, um, you know, it's, it's hard to tell going into it, but once you recognize it, you know, they've earned the right to be there. And I think we need to earn the right too. uh, Absolutely. And also it's possible that they didn't have to work as hard to get there. That's fine. That's the way life is. Like a, like we said earlier, maybe powerlifting chose me. Maybe wrestling chose them. John Cena, my, me and my brothers, we got John Cena into professional wrestling. And he was the perfect fit. Yeah. He was a perfect fit for it. He came in and he smoked everybody. But what people don't realize is the same six, eight years that Seth Rollins uh, worked his butt off, John Cena had to do the same thing, even though he was still the perfect fit for it. And so you go, you move out to LA and you're at Santa Monica uh, Community (laughs) College. Did you end up finishing college? No, I never did. I uh, didn't have that many credits left, but I just, I don't know, man. There was always something, there was always something in me that just recognized that like school didn't, it didn't fit. It didn't fit well with me. And and, uh, that's what a lot of my life is uh, obsessed with is trying to, figure out things that fit into my life, my philosophy, my family's life, my family's philosophy. Like that's what I'm obsessed with. Sometimes we'll do things here at Slingshot or at Super Training and they could be really successful, but I kind of still get upset about it if it doesn't really fit. I'm like, ah, it didn't really work. Well, I want it, I want it to be fun. I want to have a good time while we're doing this. And so for me, it's, uh, it's about trying to find things that fit and for whatever reason, school just never fit. And so I left it behind. It's actually, you know, probably something maybe I should go back and finish. Do you have any regrets there? <laughs> no, no. So, I, 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 it was good. Like I just, each move that I made, I, I got to a point where I just needed to move on. I just needed to do something else. And so when you move on from going to school, what did you pursue next? Um, I mean, you had professional, yeah, you know, wrestling, right? And now you, now what brought you back into um, powerlifting? Because you were away from it for a little bit. What brought you back in? Man, the story gets to be, yeah, the story gets to be uh, really long from here. But basically, uh, around that time-ish is, around that time is when I started, when I when I left school is around the time I started pursuing professional wrestling, which is ironic because I, I followed in my big brother's footsteps, you know, all the way. Like, he played football, then he went to college for football, and then he dropped out, and then he chased down, you know, pro wrestling. And I had some success in pro wrestling. I wrestled in Japan, and I, I got close, and I had a couple cups of coffee with the WWE. Like, I've been on TV before. I've done some stuff with them. Uh, but I, I never, uh, you know, locked into, like, a contract. And once I was uh, kind of close to some of that um, is when I had Jake. And so I had to kind of move. I had to move on from a lot of that. But rewinding back to, you know, dropping out of junior college and uh, – and then shifting gears is right around the time I met my wife. And my, meeting my wife was like the biggest uh, pivot point. And I think right around the time I met her is right around the time I started messing around with wrestling. So those two things kind of went uh, hand in hand. And 
as her and I, as our relationship developed, she was like asking me like, what do you think you're going to do with, you know, wrestling? And I was like, I don't know. I like for now I'm just learning it and it's fun and I don't know what it's for. Um, I don't really know like a hundred percent why I'm pursuing it. Cause I, I don't know what will come of it, but I, uh, I said, once I started, once, you know, once I started, I would like to try to do it for like five years as hard as I can. And if something happens then something happens and if it doesn't, then it doesn't. And so as we fast forwarded five years later, I'm in Louisville, Kentucky. We have Jake, he's about six months old. And I told her, I said, you know, it's, we're at that five year point. And I was like, I don't think you enjoy living in Louisville. I said, I'm going to tell him today. Uh, that's, that's it. I'm going to, you know, move on. And so she agreed and we moved on, moved back to California. And, um, that's when I started getting back into powerlifting. And so you um, you met your wife and so you're in, you're, you're in college, you're kind of a pro wrestler. How are you supporting yourself? How are you supporting your family or your, 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 you and your wife? How are you supporting yourself on this wrestling kind of pursuit? We work in other jobs, uh, naked pictures on the internet. Uh, I mean, aside from that, because obviously those would sell very well. But aside from those, were you working like you know? I was pretty buff back then. I'll have you know. No, I. Uh, so I had a lot of different jobs. I I was a bouncer, and you know, I I sold equipment for Louis Simmons, and I did all kinds of I did all kinds of stuff. Uh, that's one part that I skipped when we moved to the Midwest. My wife and I moved to the Midwest. Is I. Basically, I guess you'd say did like an internship with Louis Simmons, which I didn't really. I just trained with him. Uh, but I learned I learned a lot while training at Westside Barbell. Um, back to how I, how I supported us, I didn't. My wife did. My wife was the breadwinner. My wife made the money. My wife worked um, when I when we first met. She worked in uh, radio advertising, so she basically just sold airspace. Um, she worked for uh, Westwood One, and. Um, as uh, as her career uh, progressed with that, she kind of reached a higher and higher level. She was climbing that uh, corporate ladder, and she was doing really good. And my uh, my philosophy, or my like, uh, I don't know, my way of thinking is so different than hers. She is a real like type A personality. She she wants to get things done. She can't let something go, and uh, just wound tight. And I'm always like super relaxed, like. I actually had this happen to me. Somebody came and they just took my car and like towed it away. I went to go to, I went to go like, you know, look for my car one day and it was gone. And I was like, oh, I guess I'll call a cab and go to the work. <laughs> you know, like I didn't even care about like work because it was a piece of shit car anyway. So I didn't even care. I was like, all right, sign on to that. But that that's my mindset. I, I'm more stressed now than then, but uh, we kind of evened each other out at some point. And so she was getting really stressed with work. She came home one day, she was really upset, and I said, just go in there and quit. She's like, what are we going to do? I was like, I was like, I don't know, but we're in this together. We'll figure it out. It's like, just go in there and quit. Tell them tomorrow. She's like, it's like I can't do that. Like, that doesn't make any sense. I was like, what are you going to do? You keep working, keep being upset, you come home and be upset every day? I was like, it doesn't make any sense. Be all stressed out. I'm like, it's cool that you make good money from it, but, like, we'll figure, we'll figure stuff out. So she went in there and she quit. And things like that have, have, have put us against the wall uh, you know, w around the time of the creation of the slingshot, you know, we were about to like lose our home. So like things like that, they were, you know, looking back at it, it was a, these were setbacks, but I always think a setback is really just a setup for something better. And so your wife quits her job at the time. Did you have a son? Yeah. Yeah. So you had a son, mm -hmm. um, and you were kind of doing your thing. And then I imagine that was a really challenging. Oh, I'm sorry. No, we didn't, we didn't, uh, we uh, we didn't have Jake at the yeah. time, I don't think. Yeah, you probably had Jake a little bit later on. Right. And so now you, your back's up against the wall. You said you almost. So you, you come to Davis. Mm -hmm. you, you, yeah. you make your way here, and I'm really curious about this because so you get back into powerlifting, and then you're kind of working jobs here and there, but then you created this this slingshot, and so all these years did they kind of build up to this invention? And can you tell us about the invention? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It, it, and there's still like so many other years in there of like just eating shit sandwiches without the bread, as I like to call it. But um, let me try to. So I've always I've always been a dreamer, like while I am like relaxed and kind of chill about most things. I also like just I just dream big, you know, I, I and I 
I'm like, uh, I'd even say like delusional in some ways, like, especially then, like if I look back now, I'm like, what was I thinking? Like that was never going to, how did I, how did I think any of this was ever going to happen for me? But, uh, you know, um, growing up with, uh, my parents being very religious and being uh, Christian and, and, uh, you know, I have, I have faith in God as well. I, you know, I always just thought like, you know what, if I'm just, if I'm just good, like if I'm just a good person, like good things will happen. If I just think positive stuff, like positive things will happen. And so I, I tried, I mean, there's probably, you know, one or, one or two people out there that maybe disagree, but like, I've tried to always treat everybody I've ever met with, with the most respect I possibly could. And I always thought that that would, that would come back in some way and, and turn into, turn into something. Well, you've just, also coupled that though with a lot of hard work over the years. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And the hard work, I mean, you, you can't get anything without, without putting in a lot of, uh, a lot of effort. And so I used to drive around Woodland, California, and I used to just look at these, um, and I'm sure you've done this too, dreaming about having these different gyms and stuff. I used to look at these spaces all the time. I'm like, man, it'd be a great place for a gym, but I had no money. I had no, I had hardly any, any income coming in. So I don't know like why I was even like, why my mind was so obsessed with it. But, but I thought about it every day. My son at the time, uh, he was uh, an infant, and uh, you know he loved to be in the car. He'd fall asleep in the car a lot. So I would drive him around. I'd drive him around Davis. I'd drive him around Woodland, and I'd always look at all these places. I'm like, oh, that place is like 2,000 square feet, and that place a thousand square. Like that would be sick to to try to figure out something. So I, I'm having these ideas all the time. Meanwhile, I pick up a job at the high school, and I'm a um, a strength and conditioning coach, which most people saw in Bigger, Stronger, Faster. Uh, for a pioneer high school in Woodland. And as I'm, as I'm coaching, uh, a friend of mine uh, says, hey, did you know there's a gym going up on the other side of town over here? And I said, no, I didn't know anything about that. He said, yeah, it's supposed to be really cool. It's supposed to be like, you know, a, a newer style gym. It's not a commercial gym. It's to be a little different and stuff like that. And so I was like, oh, that's cool. And they, they said, uh, I guess the guy, his son was going to go through the same school district and stuff. And he said, oh, you should link up with him, man. He's, he's into lifting and stuff like that. So fast forward, I talked to this guy and I said, yo, it'd be, it'd be great if you had some, uh, you know, power to think stuff in this new gym that you're going to build, because I could see a lot of kids from the high school, you know, coming in and training. And he was all for it because his son was into football. He was all excited by it. And so he said, well, what do you think it's going to take? I said, well, I said, I, I said, you know, if you're up for it, I, I could coach everybody. I've been powerlifting, you know, since the time I was a kid. I know a lot about it. And I trained at Westside Barbell. And so I, I got some of these things under my belt. And uh, I said, you know, maybe I can work with some of these kids. But we're going to need some equipment. Like powerlifting takes, you know, some special equipment. We need some special bars and some things like that. And he's like, oh, yeah, just tell me, you know, tell me what you want. So I made up this list, but I was being really conservative because, I, you know, I thought, at the time, I thought like 500 bucks was like a big load of cash. So I wrote up this list and it was pr maybe about maybe about two or three thousand dollars worth of equipment. I was like, this would be a great start. Get like a platform, get like a bench and get like a, a squat rack and, you know, we're good to go. And so I gave him this list and he was like, this is it. This is all we need. He's like, you sure we don't need more? And I was like, well, I mean, I said you could I mean, you could really outfit the place and, and have every single thing that you need for, for lifting. But I was like, that costs a lot of money. And he was like, well, what's a lot of money? I was like, it'll probably, I was like, I don't know. It'll probably be like 12 grand or 10 grand or something. Yeah. And he was like, he's like, oh, that's no problem. He's like, let's do it, man. Let's go all in. And so he gave you an opportunity and that's, and then you started basically working, you working there. Right. That was the beginning of Super Training Gym right then and there on the spot was like it was like maybe so at the time I, I was already lifting in California. I already knew some lifters. And then I told them, hey, like uh, we got this spot and this is what's going on. And so, I mean, I remember the day we sat down at the end of a workout and one of the guys is like, well, now we kind of have a team like, you know, what is, you know, we, now we need we need a name, you know, we need a name. And uh, so I said, well, I, I said. I, I thought that this would be cool. I said, let's call it super training. And one of the guys is like, that's stupid. I said, well, of course you think it's stupid. I only thought of it five seconds ago, right. you know, because it's got, it's got to stick around for a while. Right. But the reason I named it super training was after a guy named Mel Siff, who I went to his seminar. Mel Siff and Louis Simmons did a seminar. Mel Siff is a genius. Um, and uh, they did a seminar together. And Mel Siff wrote a book called Super Training. And at the break of the, of the uh, seminar... I was thumbing through this book 
And uh, Mel was like, hey, you know, you're thinking about picking up the book? And I said, yeah, absolutely. I said, I have to run to the uh, ATM. I didn't have any money, so I, I wasn't going to buy it probably anyway. Yeah. <laughs> but I was just trying to think of an excuse. I was like, oh, yeah, maybe after lunch I'll come back and buy it. And he said, you know what? He's like, why don't you just keep it? And I was like, really? He's like, yeah. He's like, he's like you'll, you'll, you'll read it? And I was like, yeah, I'll use it. Yeah, for sure. And uh, I kept the book. And it was probably about two weeks later that he passed away. And I was just thinking, like, man, what a cool kind of thing. paying homage to yeah, him. Yeah, I was and, like, what a yeah. what a cool thing it would be. Well, that's where I so in super training and the like. Louis Simmons sparked a lot of stuff inside of me that 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 got me fired up about lifting, about you know the box squats and the board presses and all these different things. And Louis brought a lot of science into training, and I always liked a lot of that stuff, even though I've never been able to really absorb it and I've never been able to really uh, maybe articulate it in the way that some other people can. I understand it and I know it really well. And when I started looking through some of the stuff that Mel Siff had, even though his book is really complex, I mean, you have to have like a physics background to understand half of it. As I started looking through it, I'm like, man, a lot of this stuff makes sense. You know, he talked about force production and uh, speed training and the possibility of training with bands and chains and all these different things. And I was like, it's like, wow, it just it just got my mind going like crazy. And to the point where I could never stop thinking about it, even when... <laughs> Even something like watching TV, when I'd get up off the couch, I'd, I'd try to get up off the couch quick. Yeah, yeah. I would want to be explosive, yeah. you know? Getting up off the toilet, the same thing. <laughs> Sorry for the visual, but it, it, was, it, was, it was locked in, man. No, I, was lo no, I was locked in. No, I have the visual. So, so Super Training Gym was born. How much of that do you think was, you know, a lot of times people look at some of your success with Super Training Gym with Slingshot and they say, hey, you know, Mark Bell got lucky, right? And... How much of it do you think was just really good timing and how much of it was you putting yourself in a position to get that yes, to get that more money because yeah. of all the things you had done? You know, because again, I, I think you and I talk about this pretty often is that a lot of people from the outside, you know, they don't see the, the struggles and, and that's fine, right? We don't expect them to. But I think to automatically assume that someone got to where they're at because of being lucky or whatever, mm. I think that's, that's unfortunate. You know, I think yeah. people should look at it more like, hey, that guy got there because of hard work and they find out otherwise, then well, that's, that is what it is. But on this day that this gentleman provided you this twelve thousand dollars, whatever it is, and gave you the opportunity to basically open up your own gym, was that? This was inside of his gym, yeah. but it was the start of yeah. Start. Of it was it destiny? Right. Was it fate? Was it luck? Was it you putting yourself in position? What What do you think got you to that point? I think uh, as we talked about on uh, with uh, Seth Rollins was, you know, sacrificing for the unknown, doing things that you're not like, just following your gut following your heart and a lot of those things led me to like even when I was wrestling you know I didn't really know why like I, I know that my big brother did it and he was my idol and so I followed a lot of his in his footsteps but I didn't really know what it was for and then now I know what it's for now it's to be able to speak in front of people it's be able to audible to be able to change on the fly and be able to do things and uh, wrestling really opened up those doors for me. And then I know some incredible people from wrestling as well. And I just, I learned a lot of great uh, lessons from pro wrestling, which is weird, uh, that I've carried into business. I've carried into my day-to-day -day life that it's really helped uh, with a lot of things. Well, I want to talk about that. So now, you know, fast forwarding to where we're at today, you have two children, your wife is, uh, you know, highly involved in the business. You guys have a great business, Super Train Gym with the slingshot. She thinks she runs it, by uh, the way. Yeah. yeah. I'd say she probably does. Yeah. She does. Yeah. And you have a lot of different products you guys sell, and you guys are doing really, really well as a business. You've seen significant growth over the years. I mean, what is it like working with your spouse so closely? And then what have you guys kind of – I mean, you guys overcame so much adversity, I'm sure, in those early years because of financial strain. How has that positioned you for better success today? now that you don't have as much financial strain? So for myself personally, um, I, uh, I've i never really cared that much about money. And um, nowadays it's a little different because I want the company to grow. Um, I'm probably uh, kind of obsessed with it at this point. I want the company to grow because I want to provide more opportunity for the people that already work here. And I want to be able to hire more men and women because I want to provide more opportunity for more people. And so I want the company to expand. I want the company to grow. I want more people to feel the way I feel every day about coming here to this facility and the way Andrew feels. And a lot of the employees, um, uh, and I, I want to provide more opportunity for a lot of people. So for, for myself, though, I've been fortunate in the fact that, like, when I didn't have any money, I never thought I was a loser. 
I always had good work ethic. I was always a good person. So I never really thought like that money uh, equaled that I was successful or not successful. I never put any like merit to it. I also, um, I also saw my parents, I saw my dad climb the corporate ladder with IBM and then just get spit out of that machine like, like he was not even a human. He was let go. He was let go. Yeah. I mean, the, the company downsized Poughkeepsie, New York is, is, is a uh, home of IBM headquarters. And, um, they had, you know, I, I can't even remember how many employees, but some insane amount of employees and they downsized, um, when, uh, you know, they downsized and my dad got, got shot out of that place. Like he was shot out of a cannon because my dad was like probably about my age now, probably about 40. And he had a really high, you know, uh, he had a, he was had a high payroll going, and uh, he was expendable. And they could bring in three people that could you know do his job, and then some that are a lot younger. And so I saw that happen, and I was like, man, that's you know, man, that sucks, man. He he went to college, you know, he did all the right things. He went to four years of school, he got his degree, uh, he showed up to work every day on time, whether he was sick or whatever, never complained. He was one of those kind of guys, old school kind of guy, right? Um. And then just to be, you know, kicked out of there like like it was nothing was crazy to watch. But my dad didn't flinch. He didn't blink at all. He just he was like, okay, well, I'm gonna start my own business. And he started doing real estate, and he started doing taxes. But in the interim, in in the so much so much good fortune came our way from him losing that job. My brother Chris was able to go to USC Film School, which if my dad didn't lose his job probably wouldn't have happened because realistically we may not have been able to afford it even though my dad was kicking ass and making a lot of money usc is really expensive right so that would have so because my dad lost his job my brother was able to get financial aid and that helped him uh get to college um also uh also at the time uh i got to see a lot of what my family went through having money versus not having money so we lived in this giant house and i started kind of recognizing like Oh, we have a pool. We got a basketball hoop. We have weights in the garage. Like we had legitimate weights in the garage. We had a full-on Olympic lifting, uh, you know, thing going on, and it was it was crazy. And I was just like, okay, our family's a little different. My dad's a little different. Like he he makes more money. Like I kind of saw these things happen, right? But you know, my mom and dad they started out in a trailer with my oldest brother Mike as they were building their family, and we ended up back there again. And so when I was going to high school, that's we were we were in a trailer park, and when I used to tell people where I live, they were like, "Wait, they're like, what are you talking about?" They're like, "Isn't that a trailer park?" I said, "Yeah, that's where <laughs> that's where I live," and they were like always astonished because they I I guess they just thought like if you're poor you have, you look different or something I I don't know what they thought but it wasn't necessarily because we were broke it was because my dad was smart and yeah, he, he was realized trying to be conservative and make he, sure yeah set up the family for and yeah he realized look man i got to put my kids through school and like but i just i saw all the like all those things in my eyes are are really positive even though they they may seem negative they were all really positive and it, and, it, and it told me look man you put your family before everything else and that's what my parents did and it was it was amazing to to watch it's like how did my dad and mom, how did they suck up their pride and go from that giant house to living in a trailer? Well, they did it because they had to do it for their kids. And so they just they just went through it. They just plowed right through it together. And so looking at your relationship and where you guys have gone and what you guys are doing, you talk a lot about some of these setbacks. And I know your brother passed, um, which was just his anniversary, yep. um, which I'm sure is tough on the family. And so your brother passing, um, financial going like, you know, up, a lot of ups and downs for your family and then also for you and your wife. Right. I mean, and, uh, it seems like money doesn't define anything. It's just, it's just a, another component, but yeah. you want to, you want to build a business that's special and, and, and provides for people. But I want to talk about some of these setbacks and how you've kind of learned from them. So we've talked about the financial side, which I think is really, really cool to kind of see your mindset, right? It's like family first, set them up, do the best you can. And so is that a component of why you also want to build this business? Because you want to be able to set up your family. And then I also want to talk about your brother and how how that adversity helped your family potentially get a little bit closer or, or did it not, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So my um, my parents lived next to me because I, I bought their home for them. Right. Uh, I bought my dad a car. I bought my brother a car. And like a lot of the uh, fortune that, that we've made off of Slingshot has... 
uh, provided me with being fortunate enough to to give back to everybody and to be able to provide something. But buying that home for my parents was the greatest thing that I ever did because my parents are they're they're right next door. I mean, some people might be like, "Wow, it'd be crazy to have your mom and dad yeah next door like that." But like, we love it. My my dad, I, I my dad and I go for a walk every night. We go for a walk usually with my son Jake, and uh, my uh, my parents are very involved in their in their grandkids. That's why they moved from New York in the first place to come out here. Um, but that relationship has been has been awesome. And and they they they're not. They're not over every day. They're not like you know hanging out. Like they're not like waiting waiting around for me or whatever. Right, you have your you have your boundaries. They have their own. They got their own schedule too. You know, but uh, in terms of uh, you know my brother's passing um, and it making us closer, you know, it just so when my brother passed, I think having the family all come together and uh, you know going to like his funeral and kind of seeing the impact he had on so many people. Um, and seeing like cousins and second cousins and and then you're you're kind of confused you're like man like okay I live in and at the time I lived in California I was like man like that's really stupid like the fact that I live in California just because I live in California I'm not in contact with these people anymore this is kind of dumb you know and and social media to be honest has has uh, helped bring us all together cuz it's a little easier to follow what everyone's doing without without picking up the phone um but it made me kind of recognize how valuable those people are. And like, you know, everyone has that uncle or that cousin or whatever that you don't really, that you're uncomfortable hanging around with, like around the holidays or whatever. But even that person, you recognize how important that person is. Like it's, it's important to be around that person. It's important to communicate with that person. It's your family. It's really, in the end, it's kind of all that we have. Like who's going to care when you die? Who's going to really care? You know, some people might be like, "Oh, Jason and Felipe won a CrossFit Games." Like, okay, cool. And then the next day, they're told, you know, they're they're back to it or whatever. But it's going to be the the people that are going to be by your side as you're passing or as you're sick or whatever. It's going to be your wife. It's going to be your kids. It's going to be you know, if your mom and dad are still around or whoever's really close to you, those are going to be the people that are going to be right by your side uh, as you really go through hard times. It's not going to be uh, some random fan on social media. You know, it's going to be your family. And so a lot of the setbacks that we've had, it, it's made me kind of recognize that. And, and you hear it a lot and it sounds kind of uh, cliche, but you know what? It's communication is king. Communication is, is a really key element and uh, the holidays are coming up. So I'm going to encourage you guys and girls out there that are listening to this podcast to talk to your aunt that you have never really actually spoke to. Like, try to get some perspective on that person. Try to understand them better. Maybe uh, give them a drink or two to, to get yeah. more out of them. But uh, family is really, is really, really important thing to me. Well, I think, you know, obviously I agree with you 100%. When Ava was diagnosed with leukemia, it was, it was very, very clear. We had a lot of family and a lot of, we had a lot of friends who were supportive. But the family were the ones who were there every day, all day for months, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, years. Right. And, you know, I, I think what you're, what's interesting with family is that you, you kind of get family, you, you don't get to choose them, right? Yeah, yeah. But I think if you take a step back for a second, you look at, you know, everybody's life experiences allow them to be who they are. And if you kind of look back at how they were raised, what's going on, and you find a commonality somewhere that you can start a conversation. Right. And, you know, back to you in high school, you know, you're kind of like so against these other guys or girls or whoever. But in reality, like you don't know you know, if you had maybe taken a step back for a second, just appreciated for who they were as a person and their background, you could have maybe started a conversation, maybe connect with them on another level. You never know. Yeah, right. And to that note, though, at the same time, I think that like my, uh, like me being able to like channel like hatred into something positive is, is something that is still to this day very critical for me. Like, I don't know why, but that's like the way that I'm wired. So like, I, I love to... Uh, you know, use that kind of stuff as like bullets, you know, it's like, it's loading me up with more ammo, anything anyone's ever said that's that's negative. I'm like, perfect. Thank you. I appreciate that. Like you just loaded well, up my gun even more. Like I'm ready to go. Well, social media must be loading you up all, you know? Yeah, yeah. it is. It's, you know, it's, it's empowering me. It's making me stronger a lot of times. And you know, sometimes those things do bug you. I mean, how, how can it not? Right. Sometimes those things do throw you off, but 
in general, I mean, they're more they're more positive. Or sometimes I'll try to I'll try to like reflect and think. Oh, I wonder why that person thinks that about me. Right, you taking know? a step back and kind of putting the onus on yourself. Like, why are they saying this? And so to kind of wrap up this conversation, um, I just want to talk about on a daily basis. You have two children, a wife, uh, successful business, like we talk about, and you get in your training, right? What do you do on a typical day to help support all of those goals? Um, h- how do you prioritize and develop, you know, and, and how do you prioritize those goals to be the best husband, father, you know, gym owner, et cetera, business owner that you can be? What do you do during the day? Any particular strategies you might have? I try to be prepared for every day. Uh, so that way, that way, um, I, I can, I can do the best that I possibly can. I can be set up for success. And I think that, you know, sometimes people might say, oh, my schedule's crazy. I, I really can't do that. You know, uh, but I think that for the most part, you're kind of kidding yourself. I think we all know, we all kind of understand where we're going to be each and every day. We know our responsibilities every single day. And so because you know all that, you could set up your fitness, you could set up your nutrition, you could set up your religion, you could set up like whatever the things are that you want to do, uh, whether it's going to church or taking your kid to a movie or whatever, you can kind of schedule these things. You can start to, if you need to write them down or put them in a calendar or whatever, uh, my schedule gets pretty wacky. So like if it doesn't go into my calendar nowadays, I, I, I kind of lose it. I kind of forget it. And so it's it's important that you don't start a day unless it's planned. Like, and even if the day is not planned, let's say you had a really hectic couple days and you go, oh my God, I don't even know what I'm doing tomorrow. Sit down for five minutes. It's not going to take very long and think about what it is you're going to do. A lot of the guys and girls here that work out, a lot of times I'll shoot them a text at night. It might be like 830 at night or so as I'm starting to get ready for bed. And I'll say, uh, hey, you know, I'll I'll be in the gym at like 7 a.m. tomorrow because maybe like I got behind and I didn't know I was going to train that particular day or whatever. But for me, it all like the fitness side of it and the nutrition side of it are huge. Like if those things aren't in place, everything else, you know, kind of kind of goes all sideways on me. I, I really, I enjoy lifting. I have a lot of fun lifting. And uh, if I'm not on point with my food, um, not that the food like dictates my mood really, but if I'm like getting fat, I'm getting out of shape or I'm not as strong as I'd like, it, it just throws me off. It's, it's, uh, it's so part of like my DNA now that, that uh, if those things aren't in place, I, I just don't feel right. Well, I like your idea of the preparation. I think that's really important for people to think about. You know, if, if you if you segment out your day the day before, then you don't have. I mean, yeah, you're always going to have these curveballs that are thrown at you, but you're going to be better prepared for your day because you're preparing for your day, right? Instead of just kind of attacking the day day by day, you can attack it the day before, so you really thought process it out and then get into it. And I think I, that's a great takeaway. I think it's absolutely insane and ludicrous that people leave the house and they don't have any idea of what they're going to eat for the day or where they're going to go. It's like how can you be on point with your, with your nutrition? Now you're uh you know, you've been doing this for a long time. You've been in in the fitness space for a long time. So maybe for somebody like you, it's not hard for you to audible and understand what's good for you and what's not. But for most people, if you get hungry, if they get hungry, they're going to make a really bad choice. Yeah. So you want to have some food with you. Maybe Maybe like you're not a food prep person. Maybe you don't like the idea of doing all that. So there's there's meal prep companies nowadays, but even something that's really easy is to bring some cheese with you, bring some nuts with you, stop off at Starbucks. They have uh, hard-boiled eggs that are already cooked. I mean, there's a, there's a lot of options. Even when you go to the airport nowadays, there's a lot of options in terms of healthy food. They're not just junk food. So you should at least have an idea in your head of like, like, what's my food going to look like for the day? Because how are you going to leave the house at 8 in the morning and then not come back until 8 at night with no preparation on your food if nutrition is part of your lifestyle, if nutrition is if you want to lose weight, you want to be in better shape, you have fitness goals, why in the world would you not have a plan for it? And so you've competed in powerlifting at a high level. You then did a bodybuilding competition most recently. And I think what's really interesting about me looking at you is that you're kind of putting your money where your mouth is, meaning like, you today you're fasting. So you and I go to a coffee shop and you're just having coffee because yep. you're not going to eat any food. Whereas, you know, I get to grab a, whatever I got. Mm-hmm. And so you're, you're fasting. You're actually, again, you're trying it out. You're your own laboratory and then you're moving on. And so you did the bodybuilding thing, which takes a ton of dedication in terms of nutrition, which it's like a high intensity workout for, you know, your food. Yeah. 
And now what is the next thing for Mark Bell? I, you alluded to it earlier, but just to put it on proper podcast, uh, <laughs> right, what's, right. what's the goal? Yeah, so I mean, one of the things I want to do is I'd like to bench 500 pounds at, at weighing 220 pounds, something I've never done before. And so it gives me something to chase. But, you know, I'm not, <laughs> I'm not such a meathead that that's my only goal. Um, I have a lot of other goals. I, I want to continue to uh, reach more people, continue to empower more people, continue to try to figure out a way to continue to make the world a better place to lift, uh, try to continue to make great products for, for people. Um, so th those, I mean, those are just, I mean, it's a short list of goals, but like I have, you know, I have like millions of goals, you know, I have like, um, I, I always say like your goals, there's, there's bigger goals and there's like dreams, right? There's, there's really huge things out there. Uh, but then in addition to that, there's kind of almost like, I like to have my goals almost be like a checklist, yeah. you know, of things to do. So, so it's not, it's not always that hard, but when I when I get to check something off my list, I feel really good about it. So it could be something as simple as like get a haircut for the day. Like to me, that's a goal. Like, and if I get it done, then I feel good shop for Christmas, boom, done. Like I feel like I'm on fire when I get these things done. Even my nutrition or even my training could be on the checklist. Like why not? Why not keep adding up yeah, points on the scoreboard? Yeah. You're adding up points on the scoreboard. And I think that's, yeah. And I think it's really interesting. You want to be benching 500 pounds at 220 as, as one of your goals, right? It's because it's something to chase. So for example, in May, I'm competing this Legends event for CrossFit. And it's cool for me. I'm excited about it. Or I might do a jiu-jitsu competition at the end of January because it gives me something to kind of shoot for. And that's just a goal that I'm going after. But I think that translates into so many other things in your life because you're trying to get after this one avenue. But now how about these other avenues? I feel like you kind of raise the bar across the board for yourself. It has so much to do with uh, personal and self-development, you know, and I, I, I've been trying to figure out like what's the magic in fitness and I've been trying to figure out all these things over the last couple of weeks and months and what's the, what's the magic in nutrition and, and I, I have never been able to like really put it into words or to have the right perspective on it. I don't think anybody else has been able to define it either, but I feel like People that are in fitness and people that are into their nutrition, I feel like we found like a secret. And it's almost like these other people that never got into any of it, they're not in on the secret. And I, you said earlier, like, sometimes you're thinking about a family member and you're like, why? why? Like, why don't you start moving, dude? Like, you want to shake them, right? At the same time, you want to have some perspective into their life and say, okay, well, maybe it's just not their thing. That's fine. They got a lot of other things going on. I'll try to be understanding of that. But I actually think that everyone, I think, I think every person on this planet, uh, I mean, I, maybe in some other countries, maybe it's different, but like, if you're not, if you're not moving a lot as part of your, uh, everyday like life, then I think everyone needs to lift. I think, I think actual lifting, not just, you know, going on a bike and not just going for a run. I think that everyone needs to lift. I think it just does too many positive things for you. It, do, it just does so much for you. And the fact that we try to sell it on, on uh, aesthetics is a shame because aesthetics is like, it's probably like number 55 on the list of great things that exercise can do for you. Yeah, especially lifting. I mean, psychologically, the empowerment that it gives to men and women, and then obviously physical. You know, my, my wife was having a hard time, excuse me, my, my mother was having a hard time lifting my daughter in her car seat and she started lifting and boom, her deadlift goes up and now all of a sudden she can put my daughter in the car seat. And this is years yeah, ago. Yeah, that's great. So I... I, um, look, I think you've done a lot of amazing stuff. I can't wait to see what's next in your, uh, pursuit, not only the bench press, but just in terms of the business. I think you have the same mindset I do of just trying to raise the bar across the board. Where could people find out more about Mark Bell, Super Train Gym, the Slingshot? Where can we go? Uh, you can hit up my YouTube channel, which is, uh, Mark Bell Slingshot. Or you can go to markbellslingshot.com. You can see all the products that we have. We make uh, hip circles, slingshots, knee sleeves, all that kind of stuff. Anything that protects you for uh, for lifting, we make. And then uh, additionally, you can check me out at, uh, at Mark Smelly Bell on uh, Instagram and Twitter. All right. Well, uh, all right, guys. Well, I hope you all have a good day. And thank you very much, Mark. Thank you.